All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Whole Being Health. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. My name is Rebecca Jordan. I work at 21 Acres, and we are here with Dr. Sarah Sue Myers, a naturopathic doctor who has a practice called Journey Home Healing. And we're going to get started here in just a second. I just wanted to share some information with you um, that this call will be recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. We encourage discussion and we definitely want you to ask questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself. Feel free to, to speak there. I'm also going to be answering questions in the chat. So you can um, definitely feel empowered to use that feature, whatever feels most comfortable to you. We are excited to work with Journey Home Healing and Dr. Sarah Sue Myers today. Um, you may recognize Sarah Sue from our plant medicine walks that we held last year. Um, if you're interested in learning more about her, I'm going to share her website in the chat box here in just a minute. Um, and this um, class is hosted by 21 Acres. 21 Acres is a living laboratory focused on learning as a community about how agroecology, green building, and local food systems are solutions to climate change. We're located in Woodenville, Washington, although I'm currently not on campus, as you can tell, I'm at my home. <laughs> um, and uh, 21 Acres was originally, uh, uh, was a valley that was originally home to Stiligwamish, Duwamish, and Coast Salish peoples. And we um, definitely respect and honor the heritage of those peoples past and present. I'm also um, going to share a link in the chat about native lands and how you can find out um, whose native land that you're currently on. Um, Dr. Sarah Sue's in Bellingham, which was originally home to the Lummi Nations and more. And um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to her. Um, and we're, we're excited to see, um, yeah, to see more about whole being health today. Thank you for that introduction, Becca. And thank you for um, acknowledging the lands. Yes, I'm up here in Bellingham on a gray and cold and rainy day in February. Um, and I also wanna just honor that this is February Black History Month and that we all just continue to embrace and encourage um, learning about the full history um, and, and start hearing the stories of other people's vantage points of the history of this country. Doing that courageous, courageous work to make this world a little bit safer and better for everybody. <sighs> All right, so I first want to start with a little bit more of an introduction on who I am and what I do. And I want to just also um, open up some opportunity for connection and questions. So I'll ask the question now so you guys have some time to think about it um, and we'll come back to it. And the first one is just, what is something or some things that come to mind for you when you hear the term self-care? That's where we're gonna start in the series today is really hunkering in to basic elements of self-care. I actually wrote a blog post um, in the spirit of self-care, um, a little bit more renegade than a lot of my articles. It was more of a personal narrative. Um, Writing is one of my passions. Um, I've done it for a lot of my life and, and just exploring the different ways I, I like to convey and express that artistic nature, but also express the connections that I see between life and humanity, what it means to be human and healing. Um, you can find that blog on my website under the blog page, it's the most recent one. Pretty simple title, A Narrative on Care. Um, we'll come back to that. But again, I my name is Dr. Sarah Sue, and I'm a naturopathic doctor, graduated from Bastyr University. I am also 
an, a, an herbalist at heart, um, nature lover. I've worked out in nature for in many, many ways throughout my life, including fighting fires and doing an aquatic invasive species program in my undergrad. Uh, I am also a teacher, earth steward, as, and very importantly, I'm also a mother now of a two and a half year old who is having a very hard morning. Um, so I'm feeling a little tender this morning, but I think it's actually like a really nice place to be in to talk about this stuff. Uh, my business Journey Home Healing offers naturopathic care and support to those needing care beyond what the conventional medical system can sometimes offer or is able to offer. Um, a lot of times patients seek me out because they're needing something more beyond just what that system offers for them. And I, I enter in and become a part of that team and honor that I am part of a team and can provide another perspective, experienced eye, a vantage point. Sometimes I use the analogy that like in rock climbing, you know, there's the person that's climbing on the rock, which is like the really glorified part. Um, and I'm the belayer at the bottom, like managing the ropes and making sure they're safe and like um, they're not going to fall off the wall. Even if they do fall, I can catch them. Um, but I also have this great perspective of the wall and can give them advice on things they can't see because they're so close in and so much a part of just the one spot they're on. As a naturopath, I can be like a belayer and support and initiate foundations of safety and security, but also giving a much broader pick picture and perspective for my patients. And I also have an entirely different set of tools than a lot of the medical conventional system. Um, and oftentimes then they are much more safe as well. Um, one example I wanted to give was <clears throat> an, a, an example of a patient that gets diagnosed with esophagitis, inflammation of the esophagus. Um, they get the diagnosis and a medicine's prescribed proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole. Um, usually there's not really talk or conversation about diet, inflammation, or why that esophagitis showed up in the first place. And typically then that's when um, a patient will seek out my guidance. And what I usually do is I educate them about their process um, ensure that the appropriate diagnosis has been given. Um, we talk about how it's showing up and manifesting in their body and exploring ways and clues as to what that root cause might be that predisposed them to that condition. Um, in the, this patient example case, we eliminate wheat. And this is a real case, a, a real patient I've, I've worked with in the past. Um, we've decided to eliminate a food allergen um, because a lot of times inflammation can be perpetuated by something that's externally being exposed to, um, whether it's an environmental allergen, too much smoke from all the wildfires around can initiate an issue like this, or sometimes it's from the diet. And in this case, we eliminated wheat, which was an unexplored food allergy. <clears throat> and in three weeks time, the symptoms cleared up. And we found out we did not need to go and turn to proton pump inhibitor inhibitors after all. So just a little bit of an idea of what that experience is like working with me, but also working with a naturopathic doctor in general. Um, I serve the North Seattle and Bellingham area as well as Lummi Island. Um, but I also work with clients in a lot of places where naturopathic medicine isn't licensed yet, like Nevada or even in countries like Mexico. Um, not all states are licensed with naturopathic medicine. Washington state luckily is. Um, and I offer office visits for my patients as well as telemedicine visits, which has is a lot more common this year um, due to the pandemic, as well as just individual support through messaging and texting with my patients in between those more formal visits. <clears throat> Self-care is actually a really big piece in the care that I, I do with my patients. It's a really big piece in my own care so that I can show up for my patients. Um, Self-care practices can vary quite a bit from patient to patient of what's really needed and required. 
It can also, you know, these self-care practices I have observed and seen time and time again, allow the patient to participate in their own healing. And again, it may look quite different from one patient to the next. So I want to come back to that question of what does, what do you think of when you hear the term self-care? It could be one of something for yourself. It could be something that you just have, like that's connected to that term. You're welcome. If, so if you're thinking of anything, go ahead and just write it down in the chat box. I'll keep my eye on it. Um, I know for me for a long time, um, when people were, would encourage like, oh, take care of yourself or I really need to take care of myself tonight. I almost had like, I, and I don't know if this was from the media or not, but I had a very predisposed idea that self-care was equated with pampering, like um, facials and <laughs> manicures or pedicures or a, a bubble bath. Um, but I, I've, I've learned since then that there, there's things that are often a lot deeper to what self-care means. I'm seeing meditation, sleep, exercise, healthy food, yoga, yeah, nature walks, yoga, art. Mm-hmm. Arts, yeah. Oh, I've been, oh, yes, art. I think that the more we can cultivate that creativity can open ourselves up to that creativity in all parts of our lives. Pampering and indulgences are the most common thing I hear, but I am learning to pay attention to the messages my body is sending about what I need or don't need. Yeah, yes allowing yourself to disconnect from the constant chatter work social media yeah when i hear that i think about healthy boundaries knowing what you're capable of what's in your bandwidth what's not understanding and identifying where there's sinks of energy or things that just like fire and trigger you um and then it's just like it takes the rest of the day to calm it down Social media can often be that for me. And I have slowly been stepping away. I stay connected to stay connected in more of the, 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 the work and the inspiration and advertisement to offer things like this. Either pampering or denial or restriction of pleasure is what I think of. Hard to think of it as a normal routine. Thank you for that answer. That's so honest. You know, I think that there's some obstacles that can come up when, with the term self-care. Um, I think about ac accessibility, like especially if you have a sense of what that you think you have an idea of what self-care is like going to get a massage, but you can't afford a massage. And there's no way you could carve out like an hour plus travel time for a massage, especially if you're like working full time and have children or someone to take care of. Um, you know, a loved one. And my hope through this series is to help you all understand that the most powerful self-care is truly accessible because it's in here. And then the denial restriction of pleasure. Right, it, that it's, it's so interesting how much mentality and how we tell the story and our interpretation can really influence what self-care can be interpreted as. So for that, that patient example I gave, um, I asked them to stop eating wheat as an experiment. And I usually try to pose it as like an experiment, like let's just remove this variable for a bit, see what happens. Like this is a long-term thing. Um, but, and I think the hard thing that it comes with food allergies is that then the statement is, I can't have that. I'm not allowed to eat that. I can't, I won't. Um, it's very limiting and restricting versus even just stating it or navigating it in a different way of like, 
oh yeah, I can eat that, but it's going to lead to a bad day. I'm choosing to not eat that because I feel so much better when I don't. Yeah, the should and shouldn't mentality plays such a big part in that. And going from I can't, I shouldn't, I should, what are some alternative words that could come in and take the place that put get, where you can take your power back, where you can stand in your power and your agency and be an active participant in, in that choice of whether it's avoiding a food allergy or whether it's protecting, you know, a 30 minute a day meditation or yoga practice. I choose not to because I feel better. Yeah, doesn't that just sound so much more gentle and forgiving? Language has so much power when it comes to just even identifying self-care and, and then, um, you know, the boundary aspect of like protecting your self-care and keep maintaining accountability. Um, I know for me as just being pulled in every single direction, like all of us probably are, it's easy to have a sense, like, I know what I need for self-care, but my, you know, like perhaps the obstacle is like, I know what I need to do. It's just a bent matter of like, I, I can't get myself to do it. And so maybe the self-care isn't necessarily that activity. The self-care is more about digging even deeper of what is the dissonance between wanting to do something and following through and do, actually doing it. Um, I feel like the more I understand self-care, the more I realize that the most lasting sustainable types of active care are more uh, occurring in our internal landscape. Things that people don't even see. It, like we could be doing tons of self-care as we're like waiting to like get called in for an appointment or standing in line at the grocery store. And in our minds and hearts, we're like processing stuff and trying to break patterns or like reflecting on like what happened this morning instead of just like rushing the next thing and actually allowing ourselves to process it. Some of the, like the, the most like powerful self-care, we just can't, even, it's not even an external expression. Giving yourself permission to try things and see how they make you feel. Yeah. Yeah, it, there's a gentleness and a curiosity with that. So, I feel like when it comes down to it, to perform self-care, one must first know self. That right there may be the obstacle is how connected are you to yourself? How much are you on autopilot? How much are you worrying about everyone else's needs and not your own? <clears throat> Maybe self-care starts with the simple question, what do I need? Do I even know what I need? How do I know? How do I know what I need? And also that it can change day to day what might be needed. There might be some days where maybe you just need to sit and have a good cry. And there may be other days where you need to like, meet your your best friend at a trailhead and hike up that mountain together it can look different maybe another day it's like actually making yourself like a warm breakfast instead of whatever the the normal might be it can look like so many so many things <clears throat> and there's going to be plenty of people lined up to tell you what they think you need a lot of people <laughs> Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what feels true to you? You got to check in with yourself. Does this feel true? Does this resonate? Do I have respect and trust for those supporting me? Because sometimes self-care is asking for help. That's a big one I see a lot in my practice is the act and the humility and the knowing of thyself to ask for help. 
you know, when I used to fight fires, um, I had a lot to prove, um, or I felt like I did because first of all, I'm not a man. Second of all, I, I've always been kind of like more hard on my sleeve kind of person. I was actually just talking to an old friend from fire and he was just telling me like how, how caring and like nice I was, which are not good qualities that like, those are not considered good qualities on a fire crew. <laughs> they can often be signs of a weakness. So I really had to, um, find like basically figure out a way to not show weakness and prove that I could do it. Um, and so for a long time, I didn't ask for help. I wanted to like, I want to show them I can carry this 50 pound container of water, just like anyone else can. I'll carry all my bags. I don't need anyone's help. And I carried that story for a long time. And at some point, um, basically when I got pregnant, I started practicing and playing with receiving help, even when I didn't need it, or even asking for help when I knew I could do it on my own, but to just really like challenge that paradigm, like just because you can carry that extra bag, do you need to, especially if there's someone there and willing to help and support you? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Another question to consider is how do you know that the self-care you are doing is working? How can you tell what kind of trickle down side effects or results do you notice when you are doing whatever that self-care looks like for you? I mean, maybe it's just drinking an extra two cups of water a day and you realize that that afternoon crash, which might just be early signs and symptoms of dehydration go away. Um, you know, humans are dependent on certain things for survival, just like plants, they need water, they need sunlight and soil, ideally soil with um, plentiful nutrients, adequate drainage, and a healthy, um, the healthy company of mycelium and microbes, the plants also need carbon dioxide to survive and thrive. And, and just like that, humans have basic requirements, water, food, oxygen, sleep, rest, exercise, shelter, safety and security, connection and nature. And I would challenge even beyond that creativity art, as well as finding purpose in life. I arguably think those are just as foundational as things like food and water. Um, let me take a look here. I see a couple other stuff coming in. So we are basically a complex house plant. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and we're so dependent on each other. I mean, if you think about it, just at the basic foundational level, air. Both us and plants need air, but we need different kinds of air. And interestingly enough, the air that they need, we exhale. And the air that we need, they release as a byproduct. Um, we have Plants breathe in that carbon dioxide that we produce and we breathe out the oxygen or, and, and they breathe out the oxygen and just our existence at this very basic level depends on one another. But even more than that, there are many other requirements for our survival and health, which I will go into more detail shortly called the foundations of health as we perceive them in naturopathic medicine are provided by plants and nature, food, shelter, warmth, the medicines, not to even mention the intrinsic value of what nature provides to us and the spiritual value it provides to us. Aside from the carbon dioxide we exhale, I, it makes me wonder, and I wanna open this exploration up in this class of how do we 
provide some more reciprocity and get back to plants and to nature? And how do we demonstrate this understanding that we're deeply connected and honor and show gratitude and act out in stewardship? And in doing so, not only are we taking care of ourselves and our families and these precious resources that we depend on to thrive, but we also are taking care of the plants that are so supportive to us. Um, whenever I think about this, since I, I read the book, Braiding Sweetgrass, I can't not think of it. I highly recommend reading it. it um, the author is Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she just writes so beautifully about this. Uh, she's from the New York area. She's an ethnobotanist from the Potawatomi tribe and speaks a, a lot about the indigenous wisdom, but as well as her experience in academia of this. <clears throat> And what I really loved about that book throughout the experience is that it, it really does bring in education and informing and tracing back to origins, which is another thing, like, I don't know if any of you have ever taken an environmental studies class one-on-one. -on -one. I feel like that is like a big theme of understanding things like carbon footprint and the kind of cost of what it takes from the, the natural resources, whether it's natural gas or coal or material production to just consume something or find, go, go to the store and find something. Like how do we trace it back to its origins? And really understanding just how deeply that we are connected. Um, you know, it's just, it's simply about leaning in, paying attention, asking questions. Understanding root causes of problems we face is another one. You know, much just like in the way that I navigate um, care with my patients of exploring root causes. So, for example, we need clean air to breathe. It's a basic need. Due to years of fire suppression practices, climate change, policies, budgeting, and the politics that go within fire, which I have seen and heard about firsthand, um, including having to fight off a very healthy, healthy burning fire in a wilderness area with trees falling down around us because it was more of an old growth and just the nature of that habitat, which is a fire that should not be suppressed or put out, but we were put there and with decent risk and even guiding in helicopters to, or to drop bucket drops of water and fire retardant. Um, because it was a political smoke, because the smoke was coming in um, to a nearby city. And that stuff's been going on for years. And then we suppress the fire and then these major catastrophic fires happen that we are now seeing and experiencing on an annual basis, which was never the case before. We're experiencing a lot more smoky days than ever before in recent history, even in places miles and miles away from the fires. And that smoke permeates our environment. It settles in sometimes for weeks. And it's not just in, impacting human beings. I noticed this year that even like the leaves on the trees, you know, it was August, September. So right around the time that fall is kind of coming in, at least in the Bellingham, Washington area, everything just looked a little bit more drab. I felt like the leaves had more brown spots and lacked that color and luster and they'd turn colors way sooner. Not because the cold snap had hit yet that initiates, initiates that, but because of the profound stress that that smoke brought in, all that extra oxidation, um, the smoke blocking out the sunlight. So almost like the plants misinterpreted the, these smoky days as maybe the, uh, the more of their picture um, initiating factors like it getting colder out and darker out. So another big impact of that is that our health suffers, you know, with a lot of that smoke, 
I mean, equated to smoke and combustion of materials, whether it's natural materials like wood or not so natural materials, like a lot of the infrastructure that got burned in the way, like people's homes. So like there's things burning that are not healthy to be breathing in and all that stuff was in the smoke. And it leads to the increase in symptoms of asthma, allergies, headaches, fatigue, fog, swelling, congestion. And all these are just are, are signs of increased inflammation and increase in free radicals, oxidative stress, damage to cells, dysfunction at the deep cellular level, mitochondrial dysfunction, mitochondria, the part of the cell that produces ATP, which is one of the basic energy elements in our bodies. Um, as well as immune compromise. Um, the immune system can get really stressed in a, a condition like that. And I saw it kick up autoimmune tendencies in a couple patients. And I even consulted with a colleague of mine that specializes in autoimmune. And she confirmed that too, that just the presence of the smoke um, led to a lot of people having flare up of their health issues. In times where the foundations are compromised, I think, I wanted to provide a couple questions to ask. Let me just take a look to see. Mm, yeah, it uh, looks like um, Kali mentioned that even the trees and flowers are getting super wonky during the fires. So you were noticing it too. I almost wondered if it was just like my depressed outlook. I was like, well, maybe I'm just making this up, but. I just wanted to mention, we're like literally across the, you probably know this, but across the like, little road from 21 acres so definitely like the same kind of uh, microclimate down there that you kind of described mm -hmm. yeah it was tough on everything everybody you know it's like it's it's interesting that there's got to be classes to explain why as healers and those who desire healing, like why we have to create a connection to like, also like saving the earth and the environment because they really like, can you actually even like separate them? It's sort of like why at some point we had to start calling food organic, but before that it, we didn't have to because everything was just organic, but the, the lifestyle of uh, like this capitalism, the consumerism, um, or desire for quick satisfaction. There's so many reasons, so many causes to it, but um, we, I, I feel like I, my goal is to just remind you that like they go hand in hand. Like this is not specialty work, like an extracurricular activity. Like we need clean air for our lungs. Like, you know, and how do we turn to supporting and stewarding the earth and the environment, whether it's locally or there are some constitutions that feel compelled to get into more activism work. And that activism can look very different for everyone too. Um, how do we play our part to not only support and protect our land, but to support and protect our personal health, the health of our families and our communities? So I wanted to just provide some questions, sort of a template that can go beyond this example of the smoke. Um, uh, first, asking yourself, what is what exactly is being compromised right now? Can you identify that? You know, in this example, it's air, a basic foundation of health. And what is the cause of this compromise? Um, in this example, wildfire smoke is the cause or is it even further upstream? Is it the fire suppression culture the, or the, in the fire suppression techniques? Is it climate change? I mean, it's both. <clears throat> what can I do to support this compromised foundation? Both right now, and once you get your safety and security met, looking out, and now what can I do out there? I think that that's important. It's sort of like um, that whole, anal or that analogy of like, you know, if 
the face masks come out or the, the gas masks, the oxygen masks in an airplane, like you got to put yours on first before you can help someone else put on their oxygen mask, which is why I think self-care is also so important for this work is because if we're not taking care of ourselves and we're out doing like the outside external world part, <clears throat> it starts to look and feel like sacrifice. And that doesn't bode well with with health manifestations in the body either. So what can I do to support this compromised foundation? In this example, air quality. Um, can I get an air filter? Do I, you know, close down the windows and find activities to do inside? Do I consult my naturopathic doctor and find out some supportive medicines? You know, like you have to up your game with some of them, like in, taking more medicines that help combat and reduce inflammation and antioxidant, um, you know, our, antioxidants are a good way to counter that. Or you're putting more, more focus on making sure you get eight hours of sleep and maybe more time playing and having some art time during, you know, that time frame. Um, another question is how do I address, identify, and treat the cause of this issue? Let's do like another example, um, you know, food, food quality. Um, you know, there's a lot of foods that we don't know what, how they were treated, um, aside from the fact that it may be labeled organic or not. If we're lucky, we can see where that food came from, whether it was from the state we, we, we reside in or it was from Argentina. One's going to have a much more sustainable impact of consuming versus another. What else can I do for myself? So, and I think that that's just always like a good question to consider in the back of your mind and explore, especially with exploring these internal landscapes is asking yourself the question, what else? Like, what else is there? Like, I'm feeling really sad. Um, about the fire and what else? Or maybe it has something to do with like a, a challenging relationship or a difficult interaction and what that brought up inside of you. So I'm gonna go into the foundations of care a little bit more closely. Um, I just wanted to check in if there's any other questions or comments up to this point so far. Okay. And some of this is repetitive because we've been talking about it and exploring it in this conversation or more of my monologue teaching of it. Um, but number one for foundation of care or in the foundation of health is clean air and functional breathing, like we've been talking about. Um, so I, I wanted to put air. And so of course that includes the quality of the air that you're breathing in, but also um, your ability to breathe. And this is something I work on with a lot of patients too, is retraining how to do functional breathing versus dysfunctional sort of stress response breathing. Do any of you know what I mean when I'm talking about a more dysfunctional or stressed response breath, maybe from your own experience and observation or experience observation of someone you love, a family member? So first of all, I'm curious how many of you are breathing right now? I'm noticing as I check in on that, I definitely take more shallow breaths when I'm teaching stuff like this. And I, when I do, do get focused, I tend to take more shallow breaths and shallow breathing, you know, where you're a good way to find out if you're shallow breathing actually is just using hand placement, putting one hand over your chest area and one down over your belly button and seeing which part of your body moves more. If it's up here, you're using more accessory muscles. Um, these muscles were not necessarily intended as being like the primary muscles of respiration, but they're called upon and drawn upon often, especially with shallow breathing versus the main primary muscle of, of, of breathing is the diaphragm, which is below your rib cage. 
um, which is why belly breathing is so great because it helps to open and fill up the entire lung space and just rather than just taking these small sips of air, it ends up being a lot more efficient. Um, another habit I, that's common is actually even holding one's breath during certain points in the day, whether it's performing a difficult task, like whatever that is, <laughs> there are many different difficult tasks, um, but really being aware of is my breathing shallow? Is it fast? Am I holding it? And how can I slow it down? Take a time out, you know, take a couple breaths, but not just focusing on just the inhale, but giving just as much time, arguably more time and focus on the exhale part of it. Cause that's another big issue is sometimes there's deep inhales, but then the exhales are almost like, <sighs> And you do that over and over and you're going to hyperventilate yourself and it actually doesn't allow you to clear out that CO2 as effectively and can be an issue as well. And a lot of these things can impact us physiologically that lead to a sympathetic fight or flight response, just simply with our breathing behaviors. <clears throat> All right, air, we got air. Number two water. So this includes clean water as well as adequate hydration. Um, not only for us, but for our plant buddies that we're so connected to, as well as the waterways and the water ecosystems. I know we have water treatment plants, um, but I almost wonder if we've gotten too dependent on those, not like us here. When I say we, I'm, I'm talking about the collective, um, but we can on those so much, but we forget like how much um, of human activity negotiates and puts the waterway health at, at risk and at harm, not only for the water quality, but for the habitats of those, those ecosystems. Um, surface runoff is a big one. We live close to the access to the, the Puget Sound or the, the Salish Sea. Um, and I see the stream. I, I actually hope to make it, um, if the weather's a bit nicer for one of these classes, maybe in the, the April timeframe, um, these rivers that flow into the water and that's coming from my neighborhood. That's coming from all the activity and like the, you know, the fuels and the oils and the, the car washing and the garbage and all of that. It get, just flows right into the water. All right, number three, food, the real kind. Um, <laughs> food is such a loaded topic. I'm, I don't wanna get into it too much, but um, here's essentially what I think of um, with my education and experience and um, being an earth steward, here's what I identify as food. Something that has minimal steps between harvest and plate um, so, and more whole foods, plants, animals, and ideally stuff that's minimally processed and packaged, free from pesticides and antibiotics as much as possible, or that is realistic considering your circumstances. This is also tough with food is like, I, I, I like to spell these out, but I don't want it to be an obstacle or like sort of a feeling of defeat when one doesn't have access to it. But that's tough. That's a tough thing with food. There's a lot of food deserts all across the country and like major metropolitan areas. Um, other ideal characteristics of food is can you do, can you consume something that's been um, grown, harvested, produced, that's locally and more sustainably grown? Um, three major foundations that, oh, is that what I want to get to next? No, that's not. I saw another comment come up here. This month at 21 Acres, we're talking about wetlands, which are such an important ecosystem here in the Pacific Northwest. Here's what our restoration specialist just wrote about it. Cool. I, I definitely want to check that out. 
Oh, thanks for sharing that, Becca. But yeah, basically eating good food, but also like sitting down to eat it. Um, you know, trying to like eat on the rush can sometimes lead to like lower, more sluggish digestion. Um, you know, when we're trying to eat on the go, we're in this like fight or flight response. I mentioned it before that sympathetic response. When I, I'm gonna probably throw these terms out a couple more times. Um, there's sympathetic and parasympathetic. And these are the two branches to what is called the autonomic nervous system, which is simply named that because that stuff's happening automatically in our body without us part consciously participating in it. Although we can consciously participate in it. One great way that we can participate in it is through the breath. Um, another way is with the support of different herbs. Um, so when we're eating in fight or flight response, our digestive tract's actually quite shut down. Um, all the blood is shunted away from places like the digestive tract and the reproductive tract. And it's getting prioritized to other, these other areas that are needed when we're in a stress response. So our airways, our lungs, heart, um, blood flow to the skeletal muscle. I mean, essentially what our ancestors needed to like run away from the saber tooth, saber -tooth tiger. Um, so even just being aware of that and how can you activate that parasympathetic response when you're eating, um, simply just sitting down to eat, putting your food in a dish instead of eating it out of a, the pot over the stove, which I'm totally guilty of. Um, maybe it's putting on calming music or just taking a couple breaths, lighting a candle. Um, another great thing that I like to do and I recommend um, a decent amount of my patients to practice at some point in their care is using bitters before a meal. You know, a lot of cuisine cultures actually start out with more bitter things at the beginning of the meal. For example, a salad. And the salad, a lot of those greens are quite bitter to taste. And the bitter receptors on our tongue and the last third of our tongue, way back there, are actually connected to this fabulous nerve called the vagus nerve. That is one of the primary nerves of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite of sympathetic. So it's more of the rest and digest. So if we can activate the vagus nerve and enter into rest and digest with our breath and with bitter receptors, <clears throat> it actually starts to call and bring blood to our digestive tract so that we can adequately digest and absorb the nutrients from the food that we are eating and consuming. Um, and it uh, herbs are a great way to do it because herbs have a lot of bitter flavors. I mean, that's why there's there's things like, I know it, it, in Italy, they, they make different alcoholic beverages called Amaro's, which I swear is just like a, a glorified ting herbal tincture. And a lot of them have that bitter taste, like these bitter drinks that are um, consumed before a meal, but you can do it without making yourself a cocktail. Um, whether it's, you know, just having some like salad greens beforehand or find, you know, a little bit of like apple cider vinegar, or there are different bitter herbal formulations designed for this. I actually, um, picked out three different, no, four different items that I'm going to cover. Um, this one and then three other ones. That very first link goes to a winter care kit and included in that is a great um, bitter spray to you could try out before a meal. Um, exercise and movement is another foundation of care. And that one's just important for so many reasons. It's but I'm, I'm gonna keep moving on. So we are now at number five, sleep and rest, which, you know, the sleep, obviously important, but I think also rest is, is not a val an activity that's honored or valued as much in our culture, in the Western culture. Our culture, I think, identifies ourselves so, so much more with doing or like, are you, have you been keeping busy? Or like, what are you doing? How are you doing? Um, what if we just started asking our, you know, our loved ones and friends and colleagues, like, how are you being lately? 
like, oh, actually, like I've been giving myself permission to rest more. I just like to sit and stare when my son's sleeping. <laughs> like, I just, that's all I want to do. <laughs> and then, then like, what, and then I'd get inspired to like do an art project or journal or whatever it is. Um, number six is sh shelter, safety, and security. Very important for foundational health and um, self-care. Seven, connection. This is a big one. I'm actually going to be taking the theme of connection and have that be one of the major themes for one of the upcoming classes, either the one next month or the month after, because it's just so profound. And this is connection on multiple levels. So this includes connection to self, connection to loved ones, connection to community, as well as the connection to nature. Even like basic essential physical connection. And, and this goes hand in hand with the, the last one that I wrote down for um, foundations of health is nature. So connection in nature, they have, there's been measured observations in the body of what happens to somebody physiologically and at the cellular level, just with literal physical touching of the earth, whether it's a tree sitting down on the ground in the grass and the sand and getting in a body of water. Um, first of all, when that connection happens, often the breath slows. Unless you're jumping in a cold body of water, you might be doing a little bit of <laughs> readjustment and adaptation breathing. Um, cortisol levels go down. The blood gets less sticky and more fluid. There is improved cell to cell communication that can often happen, as well as more coherent communication between the intelligent organ of the brain to the intelligent or organ of the heart, as well as the intelligent organ of the gut. Um, sometimes, I, I, I'm sure you guys have heard of the gut as being coined as like the second brain. I think the heart is right there in that category. I think that they all are like at on some level, like a brain. Um, I like the, the term intelligent organ um, a little bit more. I think it broadens that, that perspective just a little bit. Um, but nature can provide so much of that just with literal physical touching of it. Um, but also just having regular time in nature. Vitamin D from sunlight is so important and is such an important thing. Not only like the sunshine can help so much with our livelihood and well being. Think of how we feel mentally and emotionally when the sun actually comes out, which is so interesting because the sun is coming out outside right now. It was so great this morning and I can feel it. Um, but the sunlight also helps initiate the conversion of the inactive vitamin D into active vitamin D in our bodies too. And there has been a lot that's found uh, between seasonal affective disorder, um, which is that sort of seasonal depression that folks can experience in the winter time connected with low vitamin D levels. So vitamin D isn't just a vitamin that helps with strengthening bones and calcium regulation, as well as strengthening and modulating the immune system, it can be quite helpful for our mental outlook as well. So of course I had to throw a vitamin D in that, that winter care kit as well. Um, as well as so a calming herbal tea. And then I just couldn't help myself. I added elderberry syrup, which is not a foundation of health, but um, in all practicality, it seems like a really good medicine right now. You know, it's it's got potent antiviral properties. Um, high in antioxidants, which help combat inflammation and oxidative stress, whether that oxidative stress comes from compromised air quality or the oxidative stress that can happen with just an emotional response. Stress, not feeling like one has like the support, not being feeling frustrated that we can't get together with those we love because we have been now enduring a pandemic for almost a year now. 
<clears throat> in that blog I wrote about um, a narrative on care, in the last part of it, it it's actually this, what I, it was my reflection on the first day of the year, um, connected to some really tough, like a really loud fireworks show that terrified my, my son. Um, he was like shake, shaking and trembling all night until they stopped, which wasn't until almost like one o'clock. Um, and we had planned to do a polar plunge the next day, like sort of, and, but like, I was just wiped the next day, but somehow we ended up at a lake. Um, I'm not even sure exactly how I got there because I was not in the mood for it. Um, but a polar plunge, a cold plunge into water, whether it's in January or June, is just another really great, fun, supportive way to support your health. And it doesn't have to be like absolutely extreme. You don't have to plunge and jump in the water. You can gently lower yourself in the water. And um, it it's beneficial in a lot of ways, including, I would say, go it, you could put and categorize cold water plunging into the same category as exercise and movement because it stimulates circulation, which is a lot of the reason why exercise and movement are so important is because it stimulates circulation and blood flow, lymphatic flow. It provides a micro stress to the body, which is, it's interesting. A lot of therapeutic things are actually like minor stressors to the body because it nudges our bodies to practice adaptation and resilience to stressors. And so something like that can also help tonify and strengthen that balance between that sympathetic and parasympathetic response. Um, even just ending your shower with for the last 30 seconds with cold water can be a great way to, great way to, to um, train the body in a safe and contained way. Like, yes, here's a stress, it's here and now it's gone. And the, you know, and now and everything is okay. And it, it doesn't force, but it gives the body the conditions it needs to practice healthy recovery and response from stressors. Um, which is a big, this is, that's a part of naturopathic medicine that we, call, we refer to as nature care. There's actually, we even took a class at Bastyr University called Nature Cure. Um, nature cures and nature heals. And so how do we begin to think about understanding these connections and things going on that maybe weren't on our awareness and how they impact the environment? And, when, and how, if that environment's impacted in this way, how does it compromise our dependence we have on the environment to, to be healthy and to have deep well-being and connection to the earth. Okay, that is what I wanted to cover today for class. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining today. I really appreciate you guys showing up and taking your precious time from a Saturday to come and listen to my thoughts and musings about self-care and how it connects to environmental care. I would, I welcome any questions or comments at this time. Um, and if there aren't any, then you are welcome to go. Unless there's anything else that you would like to say or share, Becca. Thank you so much, Sarah Sue. I just so appreciate uh, this conversation and I loved all the responses that we were getting in the chat um, about self-care. It's super honest and insightful. Um, so just thank you so much. Um, for those of you who want to join our other classes in this series, I've put the link in the chat and I'll be sending out an email as well uh, with where you can do that. Um, just a lot of a lot of gratitude in the chat right now uh, for you, Sarah Sue. Uh, looks like she may be frozen. Um, but if there's no questions, I 
I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Have a all wonderful right. Saturday, everybody. Thank you, Becca, and thank you, 21 Acres. I love you guys. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, if there's any questions out beyond this topic, go to my website to the contact me page and you can send me a message that I will receive and respond to. Um, I would love to connect more. All right. Enjoy the right. weekend. Bye, everybody.